it's a good time of year to tidy the garden shed and also to review tools and accessories to see what might need repairing or replacing. So I'm going to take you through some of my shed storage tips and also through some of the tools that I think are particularly useful in gardens in the hope that that might help you too. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and we upload weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube then tap the subscribe button and if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded tap the notifications bell. I absolutely hate tidying and often feel quite overwhelmed when I come into the potting shed and realise I haven't really been in here for several months and everything's got incredibly cluttered. And so the way I manage to do it is to set my timer for 15 minutes. I do exactly 15 minutes tidying and we've all got 15 minutes in our day and then I go back and do something else. I'll repeat these 15 minute periods maybe later on in the day, maybe the following day, but it is amazing how much three or four 15 minute tidying sessions can achieve. And I think that's partly because I just tidy. Whereas if I put aside two hours or an afternoon or something, it's so easy to have a cup of coffee, get interrupted by a phone call and so on. So it is quite effective and it stops me feeling overwhelmed by a big tidy up of the shed. Now, this is an easy record system. It's a tip I picked up from a friend of mine who has a lovely garden. When she plants a plant, she puts the label into a pot. I know it would be really better to write everything down in a diary and to keep an exact record, but to be honest, I just never get around to that. However, if you've got your labels all in a pot, it's usually quite easy to think, well, what was that penstemon I planted over there? And you get out your pot and there is a penstemon label and it's got the exact type of plant on it. Of course, this wouldn't work if you had a really big garden because you might have 15 different kinds of penstemons. But for a small or middle sized garden, when you're maybe planting just a few dozen plants a year, it's a really quick and easy way of keeping a record. But I am going to go through those now because there are some plants in there from last year and the year before which didn't survive and some labels. And it is rather a reminder that not everything does survive when you plant it in the garden. So should you wash seed trays and pots? The main reason for sterilising or disinfecting seed trays and pots is to avoid passing on something called damping off. Damping off is a fungal illness which would make your seedlings droop and wither and generally not survive. But the RHS says that if you've had damping off in your seed trays and pots, you shouldn't reuse them at all. And the main way of not getting damping off is to use seed compost which drains really well. We've got a video on seed sowing tips, which I'll put in the description below, but that is pretty much one of the main tips. British flower grower Sue Oriel says that she washes and dries her pots and trays, but she doesn't actually disinfect them. And that's what I'm going to do too. So what about this great big pile of gardening gloves? Well, all gardening gloves wear out eventually. And they also get very lost. I've got an awful lot of left hand gloves and not many right hand gloves, for example. So this is a good opportunity to marry up the gloves I have to decide which need to be thrown away and to decide to wash those that are worth keeping for another year and also to buy some new gloves. I think it's particularly important to make sure that there's protection at the fingertips when you're buying gardening gloves and also that they're flexible around the back of the hand and the wrist. I particularly like Showa gloves. I've always bought them. I've never had any particular connection to the company. I believe it's a United States company and that it sells throughout United States, Canada and Europe. And the gloves, the gardening gloves, come in packs of twos or threes. And I've probably bought my last pack about three or four years ago. And so I will buy another double pack now. I do have a wonderful pair of gardening gloves, which are apparently made out of knitted glass, although I might have got that wrong, which I bought at the Melbourne Flower Show about three or four years ago, and they haven't got a brand on them. So if anyone knows, particularly anyone in Australia, what they might be, then please do let me know in the comments below because they are fab. Now, when it comes to storing tools, I really find it much easier to hang them up. And then when I'm going out weeding or something, I can just pick the tools I want, pop them into a bag and go out weeding. 
A few years ago, I got the artist William Ford to renovate the inside of this shed and he found an old pond grid, which is you usually put it on top of ponds to stop larger birds from getting the fish and to stop people from falling in. And so he hung that on the wall, but you can find metal wall grids almost anywhere and I'll put a link in the description below. I hang the tools on with butcher's hooks and uh, once again there's really butcher's hooks you can find anywhere. I just get, go for the ones with the blunt ends rather than the sharp ends. And when it comes to the tools I'm going to start with the secateurs. I belong to a number of professional uh, Facebook groups and quite often someone comes on and says what do you think I'm buying a new pair of secateurs and two brands that constantly crop up are Felco and Niwaki. I bought my Felcos about 20 years ago and they have done me pretty well but they were getting a bit shabby and perhaps not working quite as well and the Felco distributors in the UK who are called Burton McCall offered me a free service of my secateurs. If you were paying for this it would cost £25 and a new pair of Felcos is probably around £60 so it's slightly under half price and I think it is often very much better to repair something than it is to replace it. They came back absolutely sparkling new, they're working much better, I think it was a really good thing to do. But you could also service your secateurs yourself and companies such as Felco also sell spare parts and sharpening equipment and things like that. There are excellent videos on their website. As well as secateurs, I also think it's a good idea to have a pair of snippers, and I think this is quite an individual purchase. I was recommended these Dalak snippers, which is a UK brand, by Frances Moskovitz, whose amazing herbaceous border is one of the Middle Sized Garden's most popular videos, so I'll put that in the description below as well. And she says that deadheading your borders constantly is the absolute key to having as many flowers as you possibly can during the summer. I think, having tried various pairs of snippers, that it's just a question of trial and error. I like the Dalek ones, there were a couple of other snippers that I just didn't find as easy to use, but I think that could be different for you. So I would just try out a few pairs, perhaps in someone else's garden, and then decide which brand to go for. One of the things that has really improved recently is lightweight tools. I have extra ultra lightweight loppers by Wilkinson Sword, and I also have some light ladies spade and fork, border spade and fork, which are made by Kent and Stowe. And it makes a big difference to me because I'm only five foot five, I'm not that strong to use lightweight tools. It's been a huge help in terms of gardening on my back. Um, the materials are much stronger than lightweight tools would have been. The loppers have been great. I've been using the Kent and Stowe spade and fork for about five years and they were gifted to me. Uh, for review and they've been great but both of them have just broken so that's five years of quite hard wear and you know I've no idea if that's typical but I think it is really worth looking at those lightweight tools if you do have problems with your back or you are not you know six foot tall and of course we all need several weeding tools I asked a number of experts how they did their weeding and I'll put that video in the description below. But the conclusion we came to, I think, was pretty much that there's no substitute for hand weeding because really anything you spray, regardless of what it is, will drift onto neighbourhood plants. In veg patches, of course, a hoe is perfect because you can go up and down rows, but in a crowded border that works less. So there are a number of tools and this I find very useful and it's called, in the UK, Canada, and Australia it's called a dandelion weeder. In the US it'll be called a dandelion puller but you can find them anywhere. And this was given to me as a, a present by a friend. I found it really useful. A little hand hoe is very good and this stirrup shape really works well. It kind of gets in and out the plants extremely well. And the last weeding tool that I really use a lot is this which is called a patio knife certainly here in the UK and it's got this sort of right angled blade. It's for going between pavers but actually it works very well to sort of get in and out of a very crowded border and winkle out that weed that's just between two plants or I sometimes turn it on its side and I almost use it as a hoe just to take weed seedlings off the top of the soil. Now I've had one or two comments about the artificial turf on the walls of this potting shed and artificial turf is quite a contentious subject. It's made of plastics and it is extremely difficult to recycle it even though some artificial turfs are made of recycled plastic so that is an issue and it's also not 
very good for the ecology of the soil. So in other words, in a normal lawn, you've got worms and microorganisms, and then you've got birds coming down and feeding off that lawn. And it is a very good part of the ecosystem. And that doesn't happen with artificial turf. And also anything that lands on your lawn and has to be cleared off, like leaves or pet faeces or bird faeces, that has to be cleared off an artificial lawn as well. So it's not no maintenance. And of course, that also goes for weed seeds, which settle on the surface. So you don't have to mow an artificial lawn, but you do have to weed it. There's quite a lot of weeds on the surface of artificial lawns in front gardens near me. But of course, all surfaces that you use in your garden have a different balance, but the same factors. Concrete, pavers, brick, stone, gravel, etc. Each one of those, when you make the choice, you will need to look at how sustainable they are, how much work they're going to be to maintain, and how they fit into the way you want your garden to be. Although I feel that artificial turf is not a good alternative for many gardens, and it is not wildlife friendly, and it's not maintenance free, I would not want to demonise any particular material. And of course, if it's on something like a roof garden or the walls of a potting shed, many of those factors don't exist. Establishing your own garden style is very much about deciding what factors are important to you. And if you're interested in sustainability and wildlife friendly gardens, I've put together a playlist at the end of this video. And of course, let me know your views because I'd love to hear them. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.